Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Writer's Block. I am your host, horror author James Hershey Jr. And tonight's episode is going to be a rough one. Um, it's going to be rather controversial for a lot of people, but it's 100% true. Um, tonight's episode is going to be about the Civil War. And more uh, precisely, it's going to be about the truth about Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War. Everybody views Abraham Lincoln in America as like one of our greatest presidents and that he was this champion uh, against slavery and I mean he's on Mount Rushmore, they got the Lincoln Memorial, he's a much beloved president. The truth of the matter about Lincoln and the things that he did is a little bit different than what we're all taught in school. I mean, he's almost like godlike, you know, in, in our culture, and it honestly isn't called for. If you really look at the history on it, you know, they call him Honest Abe, they say he's a national hero who saved the Union, and that he fought a noble war to end slavery, and that the southern states were evil because they seceded from the Union in order to protect slavery. To be honest with you, that's just not true. It's just not true. It, it's that old saying that that history is written by the victors. And in this case, that is exactly what, is, what has happened. And it's completely false. That's the kind of the story that they go with. And I think in, in part it's to cover up the truth of what actually happened during that time period of the Civil War. I mean, there was a lot of war crimes that were committed by the North, you know? And there was a lot of... I mean, basically it was the death of the Constitutional Republic that our founders set up. I mean, that's, that's the honest to God truth. That's, that's the point where it all changed. Because to get into this a little bit, let's go all the way back to the founding of our country. Our country was made up, before it became a country, of colonies. There were colonies to England, 13 colonies. Now. These colonies ended up becoming states when we became an independent nation, when we won our War of Independence against England, the Revolutionary War, and we set up a country. Now, each one of these individual states sent uh, representatives to the Constitutional Convention in order to try to figure out how they were going to form this country. You know, what were they going to do? Were they going to have a king? Were they going to have you know, somebody that served as a, a chief executive, which is what the uh, president is, um, would they have a life term or would they have shorter terms? How would it all work? You know, and that's how they came up with the system of government that we have now, the three equal branches, the, the uh, executive, which is headed by the president, uh, Congress, which is the legislative branch, and then the judicial branch, which is the courts. That was all decided during that constitutional convention. Now, 
you had individual states that came together to form a nation, okay, to form a country. And they, they came together voluntarily. And the understanding was that they could leave voluntarily as well. If they decided they did not want to be in the country any longer, they could simply secede from the Union and they would be gone. Because it was a Union of states. Okay, that's how our country was founded. And that's why the senators in the beginning, the senators were not elected the way senators are elected today. That was changed in the Constitution through the amendment process later on. Um, in the beginning, it was set up so that the senators were actually chosen by the state legislatures. And they were sent to Washington, uh, D.C. to represent the states. Not to represent the people, but to represent the state's interest, so to speak. That's how it was set up. Um, it was changed to popular vote, just like the House of Representatives. And that's another thing that's kind of really messed up the country. Because you don't have anybody that's actually looking out for the state's rights anymore in Congress. But anyway, that's how our government was set up. Our country was set up was a union of voluntary states. States that volunteered to join this grouping together of states to form a country for mutual defense and trade, basically. It was always the understanding that they joined freely and they could leave freely if that was what they chose to do. This got put to the test during the time of the Civil War because what was going on in the Civil War was the South basically was the agricultural center of the country. That's where all the money was made. You had tobacco, you had cotton, you had all the crops there. That was all the trade items that the United States was trading with other countries. That's where all the money came from was the South during that time period. And the North was taxing the ever-loving hell out of them and setting up tariffs and doing all kinds of things that made it very unfair and very hard on the Southern states. They were basically milking the Southern states for everything they were worth. And the Southern states wanted to get out of that. Now, that right there is where the core of the Civil War actually is. Okay, it's not really about slavery. It wasn't at the time. Um, in his first inaugural address, President Lincoln stated very, very clearly that, uh, number one, he had no legal authority to interfere with slavery where it already existed. And number two, that he had no inclination or no intention to do so. Even if he would have had the legal authority, he wasn't going to do it. Um, and number three, that he was going to enforce the Fugitive Slave Act. Now, the Fugitive Slave Act uh, was a piece of legislation that called for returning runaway slaves that uh, escaped the South and went to the North. They called for returning those slaves back down to the South. So Lincoln said not only did he not want to end slavery at all, that he didn't have the power to end slavery, and even if he had the power, he wouldn't do it because he didn't want to do it. And also that he would enforce the Fugitive Slave Act, returning escaped slaves back down to the southern plantations and their masters. And number four, he also said that he fully supported the 13th Amendment that was being debated in Congress at the time, which would protect slavery forever and was irreversible. Only another amendment to the Constitution would cancel that out. Now, that obviously didn't get passed into law. I mean, it didn't get put as an amendment to the Constitution. It didn't get passed by the states. But it was being debated at that time to protect slavery forever. And Lincoln stated in his first inaugural address that he fully supported the 13th Amendment and would help push to try to get it passed so that slavery would be protected forever. He later famously stated, and this is a quote, do not paint me with the abolitionist brush, end quote. Okay, so the whole idea of Lincoln being this rabid anti-slavery force just simply isn't true. I mean, his own words tell you it's not true. Now, there was some opposition to slavery in the country at the time, but Abraham Lincoln was willing to concede everything the South wanted regarding slavery to keep the Southern states in the Union. 
So he was willing to say, slavery will be here forever. We will not stop slavery in any way. We'll return your slaves to you. He was willing to do all that just to keep the South in the Union. Okay, and that's all 100% true, 100% fact. You can look it all up. Now, given all these facts, the idea that the South seceded from the Union in order to protect slavery is absolutely absurd. And the idea that Lincoln fought the war to end slavery is just as ridiculous. That's simply not why he fought the war. Lincoln said himself in a very famous letter that he wrote um, after the war had already begun that his sole purpose uh, in the war was to save the Union and not to either save or end slavery. He also said in that letter that if he could save the Union without freeing a single slave, he would. Now, I don't know about you guys, but to me, nothing in the world could be clearer than that. I mean, that's Abraham Lincoln in his own words saying that it was not about slavery. That he would be happy to not free a single slave or to not save slavery. He really didn't care. It wasn't about slavery for him. Okay, so let's go back a little bit to the history before the actual Civil War started. And let's see what really led up to it. Let's see what the truth is here. For decades before the war, the South had been supplying about 85% of the country's revenues. Now this was accomplished through very, very harsh tariffs, like I was telling you. And nearly all of that money was being spent in the northern states to boost its economy. Um, they used the money to build manufacturing, to build infrastructure, uh, railroads, canals, all that kind of stuff. Um, and with the passage of the 40% moral tariff, the final nail was in the coffin for the South. Okay, that was going to just end it for the South. Okay, now the South did not secede to protect slavery. That's just fact. Now the South did want to protect slavery. That's 100% true as well. I'm not saying the South wasn't big on slavery, that they didn't want to protect it and they didn't like slavery. They did, because it provided the labor that they needed to work the fields in order to harvest the crops that they were growing in order to provide the money for the entire country. But it it's just simply not true that the South seceded only because of slavery and to protect it. What they actually seceded over was a dispute about unfair taxation and about an oppressive federal government that was taking advantage of them and robbing them. And they also seceded about the right to separate themselves from the country and from that oppression because we are supposed to be governed by consent this is exactly the same issues that the founding fathers fought the revolutionary war over unfair taxation an oppressive government that was just stealing from them and a government that was not in place by their consent okay the south wanted to simply do what was agreed upon when they first formed the Union. And that was if they were unhappy with the way the country was going, if they were being treated unfairly, and they could not get um, justice through Congress or the courts, that they were free to leave the Union just as easily as they came into it. That was what was supposed to be able to happen. That was what the states were promised at the Constitutional Convention. That's why they all agreed to form the government. Now, a member of Lincoln's cabinet suggested to Abraham Lincoln that he should let the South go in peace, that there shouldn't be a war, there's no reason to fight, that they were free to go if they wanted to. And Lincoln replied to him, and I quote again, quote, let the South go, where then would we get our revenue, end quote. So that tells you right there what this was all about. He had the opportunity when the South seceded to let them go peacefully, the way that it was supposed to work. But as he said right there in that quote, he knew that if the South left the Union, that 85% of the country's income would go away. 
The dirty truth of the matter is, the North simply could not survive without the South. The, without the South, the North would have no money for anything. They wouldn't be able to fund their government. They wouldn't be able to run their government. They wouldn't be able to take care of their people. Nothing. The South was providing all the income. Well, not all of it, but 85% of it at the time. So they couldn't let them go. So instead of letting the South go in peace, like one of his cabinet ministers suggested, and like the Constitution said he, he was supposed to, instead of that, he launched a brutal empirical war to keep the free and southern states in the Union through force. Now keep in mind these states along with the northern states had created the Union and voluntarily joined. All they wanted to do was voluntarily leave the same way they voluntarily joined. Now let's go over a little bit of what he did. I mean, in his first four months of his presidency, he basically created a complete military dictatorship. Um, it, it shredded the Constitution, and in all reality, it ended forever the Constitutional Republic, which the Founding Fathers and all of the free individual states had instituted for us. Um, he also committed horrendous crimes against civilian citizens and laid the groundwork for the uh, oppressive federal government which we as Americans still suffer under to this very day. So let's go over a, a list here of some of the things that he did in his first four months in office. Um, he failed to call Congress into session after the South fired upon Fort Sumter. Now that's in direct violation of the Constitution. Because keep in mind, only Congress, according to the Constitution, only Congress has the power to declare war. The president can't do it. As soon as there's an attack, he's supposed to call Congress into session, if they're not already in session, and ask for a declaration of war. He didn't do that. Um, he called up an army of 75,000 men. And in doing so, he bypassed the congressional authority in direct violation of the Constitution once again. He unilaterally suspended the writ of habeas corpus, which only Congress can do, once again violating the Constitution. Now, this gave him the power to arrest civilians without charge and to imprison them indefinitely without trial, which he absolutely did once again in direct violation of our Constitution. He ignored a Supreme Court order to restore the right of habeas corpus, violating the Constitution again, and also ignoring the separation of powers, which the founders put in place exactly for this very purpose of preventing uh, one man using tyrannical powers as the president. Um, when the Chief Justice of the United States of America forwarded a copy of the Supreme Court decision to Lincoln, instead of stopping what he was doing, instead Lincoln wrote out an order for the arrest of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and gave it to a U.S. Marshal to have the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court arrested, once again, in direct violation of the Constitution. Lincoln unilaterally ordered a naval blockade of southern ports, which is an act of war, and only Congress has the authority to do, once again, in direct violation of the Constitution. Now, on this part here, as we go, it's going to start to get even worse. I know you're going to say, how the hell could that be worse? I mean, this is pretty bad already. But this is where he starts to get really out of control and really start to, to attack normal citizens' rights and not just, uh, you know, usurping his powers and taking powers away from the Congress. But this is when he starts really attacking the citizens of the country, not only the South, but the North as well, and taking away their constitutional rights. 
He commandeered and closed over 300 newspapers in the North. Not in the South, in the North. And he did so because of editorials that were written against his war policy and against his illegal military invasion of the South. So you had newspapers in the North that were writing against Lincoln saying what he's doing is illegal. He's violating the Constitution. He does not have the power to do this. The South is free to go if they choose to go. That's what the Constitution says. He has no authority to do this. It's illegal. Because they were writing that, Lincoln basically took, to, took over the newspapers and closed them down, over 300 of them in the North. Now, this clearly violates the First Amendment of the Constitution. It violates the freedom of speech, and it violates the freedom of press clauses in the First Amendment. Uh, Lincoln sent in army forces to destroy the printing presses and all of the other machinery at those newspapers that he closed down. Once again, in direct violation of the Constitution. And then Lincoln arrested the publishers, the editors, and the owners of these newspapers. And after he arrested them, he had them imprisoned without charge and without trial for the remainder of the war. All of which is in direct violation of both the Constitution and the Supreme Court order that he chose to ignore. Lincoln also arrested and imprisoned without charge and without trial another 15 to 20,000 U.S. citizens who dared to speak out against the war to speak out against his policies, or were only suspected of anti-war feelings. So here you have Lincoln not only arresting and imprisoning without charges and without trial, ever having a trial or ever having charges filed against them, 15 to 20,000 American citizens because they dared to speak out against the war, or they dared to speak out against his policy. But you also had Lincoln arresting and imprisoning without trial and without charge people that he just suspected had anti-war feelings. You had people being arrested for how he thought they might feel about what he was doing. Still think he deserves a statue? I mean, are you starting to see the picture a little bit? It's kind of nuts, isn't it? Now, I want to put that in, in context for you here. I want, I want you to understand because 15 to 20,000 people is a lot of people, but it doesn't sound like a ton of people, right? Relative to the size of the United States, it doesn't sound like it's a whole bunch, even though even one person that's arrested without charge and without trial for simply what they believe or what they say is 100% against the Constitution. It should, it should disgust every American to hear that. But I want to put this into context for you a little bit. Relative to the population at that time, okay, Basically, that would be equivalent to President Bush or President Obama or President Trump nowadays arresting and imprisoning in between 150,000 and 200,000 Americans without trial for simply disagreeing with the Iraq War or the war in Afghanistan or their policies. Now, imagine that. If you would have had... George W. Bush or Barack Obama or now President Trump, if you would have had one of them arrest and imprison between 150,000 and 200,000 Americans just for disagreeing with them, throwing them in jail with no charges being filed and no trial, just snatching them up and saying, you know what, you don't agree with me, you're going to jail. Arrest them and throw them in prison. If you would have had that happen, there would have been an uproar like you never would imagine. That's what happened before, during the Civil War time. That's what happened. That's what Lincoln did. He rounded up 15 to 20,000 people, which was equivalent uh, in the same ratio of population to 150,000 to 200,000 Americans now, simply for disagreeing with him. He also sent the, the army to arrest the entire legislature of Maryland 
in order to stop them from legally meeting. Now the reason he did that was because the legislature of Maryland, they were debating a bill of succession. They wanted to secede from the Union just like the South did because of the things that Lincoln was doing. So they were meeting to debate it and to go forward with seceding from the Union. Lincoln didn't want them to secede from the Union, so he had the entire legislature arrested. And they were all imprisoned without charge and without trial. Imagine that. A whole state legislature was arrested and imprisoned with no charges and no trial. And it may be obvious to say, but I'm going to say it anyway, in direct violation of the Constitution. That would be like nowadays, President Trump not agreeing with, with what you were doing, and you decided, well, we're, like, there's been a lot of stuff, talk in the news about California deciding they wanted to leave the Union, right? They were talking about seceding from the Union uh, a couple months ago. That would be like President Trump saying, Oh, you want to get together as a, as a legislature legally and discuss uh, secession from the Union? Okay. Then I'm going to arrest every single one of you and throw you in jail with no charges. No trial, no charges. You're just going to be held until I decide you can go home. Years. That's what we're talking about here, people. To me, that just sounds insane that he was allowed to get away with that. He also unilaterally created the state of West Virginia in direct violation of the Constitution. He took an existing free state, the state of Virginia, my state, and he split it. He cut a hunk off of it and made it West Virginia. The people of Virginia did not vote to form West Virginia. The people of West Virginia did not vote to leave Virginia. Lincoln simply decided he was going to split it in half because it was a, a big, powerful state, and it was the head of the Confederacy. So he just split it up. He sent 350,000 northern men to their deaths in order to force the free and sovereign states of the South to remain in the Union. Now, the people of the South legally voted to peacefully withdraw from that union. There was nothing illegal about their vote. There was nothing illegal about the South seceding from the union. They had the right to do so, according to our Constitution. But Lincoln didn't see it that way. He was going to preserve the union at all cost. And the reason, what it all boils down to honestly, is to continue the South's revenue flow into the North. Period. <laughs> Point blank and simply said he wanted to keep the money flowing. The South was the sugar daddy of the North and he wanted that good time money to keep on coming. And frankly he didn't give a damn how it came. He didn't care whether it was because of slavery that the South was able to create that revenue because he, he needed that revenue in order to run the North. Now these are just a few of the worst things that Lincoln did during his presidency. He basically set himself up as a dictator with powers that had never before been utilized or frankly even imagined by any previous president. Now during this four years of war he was one of the the world's biggest tyrants, one of the biggest tyrants the world has ever known. The tyranny that he focused on his own countrymen, not just in the South, but also in the North, was unbelievable. I mean, he was called a tyrant by many, many newspapers and citizens in the South and in the North. And they, he, they kept calling him a tyrant and saying that what he was doing was illegal until basically he imprisoned everyone who dared to speak out against him. I mean, those who disagreed with Lincoln were branded as traitors. They were put on the exact same level as the men in the southern states 
that had legally seceded from the Union. And basically, they, they legally seceded from the Union over issues exactly like this, of criminal abuses of power by the federal government. Now, four months after Fort Sumter, when Lincoln finally called Congress back into session, it had reached a point where no one dared to oppose anything he wanted, or they, no one dared speak out against him, because they all were afraid that they would be imprisoned. He had already proven with the legislature of Maryland that he was not above imprisoning Congress without trial or without charges. So what he basically accomplished is to silence any opposition in Congress. They weren't going to do anything to stop him because they were afraid they would be thrown in prison because he'd already done it. Now the Union Army under Generals Grant, Sherman, uh, General Sheridan, and President Lincoln they committed genocide against Southern civilians. Now, I know this might be difficult for some of you to believe, but it is plain to see in their writings and the dispatches of the time and absolutely indisputable in their actions. Tens of thousands of Southern men, women, and children, civilians, not soldiers, civilians, white and black people, both slaves and free people alike, were shot, they were hanged, they were raped, they were imprisoned without trial, their homes, lands, and possessions stolen, pillaged, and burned to the ground. That's what happened. Now history doesn't talk a whole lot about that. They talk about it the burning of Atlanta. They, they talk about it a little bit, but they don't talk about how commonplace that was and how many people were killed. I mean, Union Army would basically come in and they'd raid your, your, your farm or plantation and take everything of value. Not only just your food and your supplies, they would take everything that had any value. They would rape the women that lived there. Anyone that tried to stop them would be murdered. And then they would hang whoever they felt like hanging. And they'd burn the place to the ground and they'd move on. You can see a little bit of that in the, in the movie Gone with the Wind, that famous movie where, you know, the plantations are being burned. Uh, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't go all the way into it. Um, if you want um, an excellent expose on the war crimes that Lincoln and the Union Army committed and the, basically the extent of them, there's a book called War Crimes Against Southern Civilians. It's by Walter Bryan Sisko. I suggest that you check that book out and give it a read. And you'll see stuff that you never knew, that you never learned in history class. That's all documented and 100% true of what happened during the Civil War. What actually happened. Not what you're taught. Now, only after the Union had suffered two years of crushing defeats in battle, did Lincoln decide to emancipate the slaves. And it was only a war measure, basically, a military tactic. Um, it was not for moral or humanitarian purposes. Now, you might say, James, that's a harsh thing to say, man. I mean, how do you know that? How do you know that, that this isn't what was in Lincoln's heart all along? and that he just decided to do it at this point in time. Well, I know that because he admitted it. This is what he said, and I quote once again, quote, we must change tactics or lose the game, end quote. Now, the context of that is he was hoping, and you can see this in the original draft of the document, he's hoping that by freeing the slaves, a massive slave uprising would occur, which would make it much, much harder for the Southerners to continue fighting the war. Because, see, the Southerners were, were kicking the Union's ass. That's just the truth of the matter. And they just, Lincoln just kept throwing Union soldiers into the meat grinder and getting them killed. And what he was hoping by the Emancipation Proclamation, he was hoping 
that he would cause massive uprisings of the slaves in the South. And instead of fighting the Union, the Southern soldiers would have to turn back around and fight the slaves to protect their own selves and their own families. And that would give the Union a chance to come up and attack as well and murder them all, kill them all off. That's what he was hoping for. That's why he did it. Now his only interest in freeing the slaves was in forcing the South to remain in the Union. That's another statement that you're going to say, whoa, 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 whoa. How do you know that he didn't also want to free the slaves? You know what I mean? Maybe he was an abolitionist at heart. Maybe, yes, it was beneficial to him. Maybe he was hoping for a rebellion, but also maybe he really wanted to free the slaves. Well, his Emancipation Proclamation was denounced by Northerners, Southerners, and even Europeans for its absurdity and its hypocrisy. Because it only freed the slaves in the southern states that had seceded. It kept slavery intact in the north and in the border states. So the Emancipation Proclamation did not free any slaves in the north or in any of the border states. It only freed the slaves in the, in the southern states that had seceded. Now Lincoln could have freed all of the slaves that, with the stroke of a pen if he wanted to. Especially the ones in the north because they were under his control. See, that's another thing people don't realize. They think that the only slaves in the country were in the southern states. That's just not true. And he could have freed them all, but he didn't. He only chose to free the slaves that were in the south. And the reason he did that is because he was hoping there would be a huge uprising. And it would distract the southern army so that they could, the Union could win the war. So basically, the Gettysburg Address, the most famous speech in American history, is in all reality just a piece of war rhetoric. It's propaganda. We were not engaged in a great civil war to see whether that nation or any nation so conceived can long endure, as he said in the speech. That's not what was happening here. The South was engaged in a war of independence from a tyrannical north. Basically the same thing that our founders were doing when they, when they went to war against England to try to escape. The South legally seceded from the Union and only wished to be left alone. It was the North that engaged in a war of empire to try to keep the South against its will under its thumb and under its control. Government of the people, by the people, and for the people would not have perished from the earth had the North lost the war. It was actually the exact opposite. Because it perished in the United States when the North won the war. For freely representative government, by consent of the governed, is exactly what the South was fighting for and exactly what Lincoln's military victory destroyed. The checks and balances of powers, the separations of powers, the constitutional constraints that were so carefully and deliberately put into place by the Founding Fathers had all been destroyed in Lincoln's first months. The Republic which the Founders gave us had been completely destroyed and a new nation state was set up. One in which free and sovereign states would only be vassals and tributaries, themselves being slaves to an all-powerful, oppressive federal government. Now this new nation state is completely different in both nature and in consequence to the original American Republic that our founders gave us. All you really have to do is look around you today and you will see the end result and the legacy of Lincoln's war, his destruction of freedom and his institution of a centralized governmental power, which leads to tyranny. There was over 700,000 lives lost in the Civil War. 
over 700,000 Americans died. Imagine if those people would have lived, what they would have been able to contribute in inventions and talents and creativity, just the amazing things they could have done if they would have been around. But instead they're dead. The government that we have today, the country that we have today, is not what our founders set up for us. This is not the way it was supposed to work. All you have to do to know that is true is to simply read the Constitution. And you will see that the overwhelming majority of the things that the federal government does today they really have no power to do according to the Constitution. The Constitution grants the federal government the power to regulate interstate commerce and to provide for the common defense. That's all. Everything else according to the Constitution is delegated to the states. The states are supposed to be handling everything else. If you just simply go through the federal government, you look at all the different departments they have. Department of Energy, unconstitutional. Department of Education, unconstitutional. There's so many different things that the federal government is doing that they have no power to do, according to our Constitution. But see, we've reached a point in this country where the Constitution simply doesn't matter anymore. They don't care. They know damn well they're, they're not following the Constitution and they don't care. Even the Supreme Court, which is supposed to be upholding the Constitution, they're supposed to look at laws and they're supposed to judge whether those laws are constitutional or not, whether they follow the Constitution. But that's not what they do anymore. It's all political. If a Democratic president appoints people to the Supreme Court, they will be liberal Democrats that will go along with everything the Democrats say, and they will go against everything the Republicans say. When the Republicans put people on the Supreme Court, they view things through a conservative view, through a prism. They may not be as extreme as the Democrats, but they do basically the same thing. What they're not doing is their job correctly. That's not what they were designed for. They look at precedent and they look at ideology before they look at the Constitution. It is plain to see, I mean, let's look at, look at the big issue right now, which is health care. okay? It is plain to see that the Constitution of the United States of America does not give the federal government any kind of power to rule over health care at all. It also does not give the federal government any power to take money away from people that are working and earning it and give it to people who aren't to subsidize health care. It, it, there, it's not there. It's not in the Constitution. But that's what's happening. And when it, that case went to the Supreme Court, it was upheld. Now, that should have been a very simple thing for the Supreme Court to look at the law, you know, what we called Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, to look at that law and say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. The federal government has no power to do this. It's unconstitutional. Strike it down. That should have been a no-brainer. It should have been unanimous. But instead, it was a split court. And that's what happens on every single case just about, is it's split right down party lines. Our system is seriously, seriously broken. And where it all started was with Lincoln. 
That's when the states no longer had the right to leave. They no longer had power. They didn't have the power that they agreed to in the first place. From that day, we've been a different country. Now, I know some people are going to are going to listen to this and be angry. Because Lincoln is a hero in America. But all I ask of you is to simply do the research. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. Look it up for yourself. And you will see that what the truth is. And any way you do it, whether you agree with me or you don't agree with me, is fine. Because you have that right as an American. You have the right to make up your own mind and to believe what you want to believe. I'm not going to tell you you're right. I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. I'm not going to say that you're a bad person for believing whatever you believe. That's your choice. I'm simply trying to tell you the truth about what happened. Because I love history and I do a lot of research on history. So just simply look it up for yourself. You can always check anything I say on these shows. It's very simple to do. Just just do the research and you'll know for yourself. But either way, I still love you. And until we talk again, love many, trust few, and do harm to none. Bye-bye.